Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is my great pleasure to invite you to this uh, evening. Uh, I've been given the pleasure uh, on behalf of the Czech Liaison Office for Education and Research to welcome you here today. Um, and uh, the mission of our office, as some of you know, uh, is among others uh, to showcase Czech scientific excellence. And uh, we're very happy that we get to do that with um, the hosts of this event, the Prague House, along with the uh, representation of Southern Moravia to the EU, as well as uh, Czech Center Brussels. Uh, with the planning of this event, we were fairly lucky, uh, because as some of you who follow scientific news know, um, the UK has introduced the world's first legislature very recently, uh, allowing the use of CRISPR for the treatment of sickle cells and uh, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Uh, well, this uh, revolutionary decision uh, opens up new doors for new solutions, uh, but also raises a lot of uh, fairly ambiguous ethical questions. Uh, and uh, we're very glad that Aj Betaresnerva has uh, accepted uh, our invitation for tonight. Um, uh, to help us sort of navigate the ethical minefield uh, of uh, gene editing. Um, and also to present us her uh, own research uh, focusing on uh, gene therapy as well as nanorobots. Uh, but I will let uh, Olga Maximova, uh, today's evening moderator, uh, to tell you a little bit more about Algebeta in a, in a second. Uh, some of you might uh, remember Olga from our previous edition of uh, EduCafe. Uh, where she focused on the uh, um, women in STEM fields uh, discussion. And she is also the head of development of Chequitas, uh, the nonprofit organization in the Czech Republic, which aims to make IT education more accessible to disadvantaged women uh, in the Czech Republic. And uh, she's also an experienced moderator. <laughs> uh, so, Olga, the floor is yours. Um, I'll leave you to it. Have a pleasant evening. David has just said everything I wanted to say, <laughs> so there's not, not much for me to, but we didn't know where to sit, David. Uh, is, there, is there, uh, are there designated places for us to sit? Okay, I look better from the left side, so. <laughs> you, you, you can, yeah, 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 you, you, can, you can sit wherever you like. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here. I, I'm really sorry for the wait, uh, but I was moderating uh, another discussion about gaslighting and the effect on young people in uh, today's world, maybe. Uh, the young gentleman would like to, to tell me more about it later. So I'm sorry we're starting uh, maybe a bit later, but um, I would like to welcome a very um, extraordinary person here tonight, uh, Alžbita Resnerova. Uh, she is a Czech um, scientist, researcher. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you ref reference yourself? A scientist, a researcher? A scientist sounds better, I really like it. Uh, Alžbita uh, works Alžbita's work uh, at the intersection of molecular medicine and nanotechnology has been pushing the boundaries of what is possible in uh, biological applications. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more about her background, but then it would be good if we could also explore that. Alžbita uh, finished uh, her master's degree uh, at the Humboldt Uni University in Berlin in molecular medicine before returning to Czech Republic. But now uh, she works or researchers at SciTech, which is Central European uh, Institute of Technology, uh, where she is using nanorobots and nanotools for diverse biological applications. I can't wait to discover what it is. <laughs> I don't know whether you are, whether there are any laymen or laywomen in this era. Can you, can you raise your hand if you really don't know what we're going to talk about tonight? Great, great. You are going to love it. <laughs> You're going to, to discover a brand new world because I did when I was researching and, and reading about the area and I thought like, oh my God, holy crap, that's, a, that's such a shame that I never studied um, science. And how many of you are from the field? Are there any scientists here? Yeah, anyone who's ever applied CRISPR? Oh yeah? I will remember you, good, <laughs> good. I would like you, if, if you can, uh, as, as we talk, as we discuss, please uh, make note of your questions. It would be really good if we were an engaged audience. This isn't only about me facilitating and Alžbeta talking about um, her research, but also you, you're here to find out what is happening uh, in this field. Uh, but maybe we can uh, take a seat now. 
please, uh, you look better from the... <laughs> right, you, you can sit there, that's fine. So, Alžbieta, we will be talking about gene editing today. Yeah, try the mic. Yeah, I think you're right. I never really thought that uh, something like that was possible. Uh, can we start, though, with something a bit different? Because you now focus on nanotechnology and nanorobots, right? And these two themes, nanorobots and nanotechnology and gene editing, don't have much in common. Is that, is that right? No, they don't have much in common. Yeah, okay. that's true. Okay, so can you tell us what you focus on now and a, a little bit about nanorobots? So I'm basically trying to merge these two fields, field of nanotechnology and field of molecular medicine. What I'm trying to aim is to create a delivery platform for biologically active molecules. And they, these can be, like, you can count, like, chemotherapeutics as mm -hmm. biologically active molecule, or it can be CRISPR for gene editing. So it's really important to have a vehicle for the therapy. Mm -hmm. So you cannot inject gene therapy in form of CRISPR just like that, intravenously. It's not going to do much. You need a vehicle that's going to deliver it to the target organ, to the target tissue, to the target cells. Also, we don't want therapies to cause side effects. Like, for example, chemotherapy has a lot of side effects. If you just inject it systemically, uh -huh. it's going to do a lot of trouble. So the idea behind merging nanotechnologies and medicine or biology is to create more targeted, more specific therapy that would be smarter, that would be more, more gentler, and that would be also efficient. So yeah, this is what I'm trying to do, to create these vehicles that deliver stuff in your body. So, so the vehicles, the, the carts or the trolleys, mm -hmm. are they nanorobots? Is this what, what we would refer to as nanorobots? Well, not always. Mm -hmm. So the last time I actually worked with nanorobots is a few years ago. Right now, I don't work with them currently, but I'm going to work with them in the future for sure, because I really have them close in my heart. I really love them. They're really cute. They're cute. And <laughs> How do they look, by the way? Um, uh, well, are, are, are they something palpable? Can we see them or are they more well, You can see them under microscope. Like, yeah, microscope, yeah. but not a normal microscope. It has to be like, <laughs> oh. yeah. So nanorobots, many people think that they look like little men with like heads and antennas and stuff. Why men? Why uh, not women? Oh, or little women. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my field, you know, so of course. <laughs> with like antennas and hands and things and right now it's not true they look like mini rockets or like mini tic tacs mm -hmm. like the bonbon that you mm -hmm. eat tic -tac, like yeah. yeah so when they are fueled they are somehow like they are moving they're actively moving and they can be fueled by various fuel sources you can use thank you you can use like stuff like glucose uh, which is nice because we have a lot of glucose in our blood, so they could be powered by glucose in blood. Or you can use magnetic field, or you can use you can even harness other cells and create nanorobots out of them, like for example sperms and so on. So it's really exciting. But back to your question, um, these vehicles that we talked about, they are not always motorized. You can also create smart nanoparticles, mm -hmm. and they're not going to be motorized. They're going to be passive. But nanorobots, that's a new step. That's like an extra step. And nanorobots are very new in the nano family. They're, they're pretty new. They're the youngest offspring, basically. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. I, I wanted to ask you, so, uh, this isn't a question that I have it just occurred to me. It must be very expensive to, to design, create a nanorobot, something so small that, it will, that can actually get into your body and fix a gene. Oh my God, like that, that must be very expensive. Can you, can you maybe comment on that? Like how, how do they? Well, I think science in general is expensive. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't matter that much what you, what you do. Mm -hmm. It's all very expensive. And I, even myself, I can't really imagine how such mm -hmm. a therapy, how expensive it would be if it was applied on humans. Right now it has never been, in okay. like nanorobots. But um, yeah, it definitely is expensive, but so is many other things. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can nanorobots be used for gene editing? Well, right now it's a 
It's more like a sci-fi, mm -hmm. honestly. I think that in the future, yes. But that's something you focus on, right? Uh, that you I don't actually no? connect nanorobots mm -hmm. and okay. gene therapy. It's like two separate things. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm more trying to create like passive nanovehicles right now mm -hmm. for gene therapy because nanorobots are so new that it's really hard to get them into clinic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's like it's a basic research, and if you use uh, nanoparticles, it's much easier to be more translational uh, with it and maybe get it into a clinic one day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, we're gonna get to, we're gonna get to that with, with one of my questions. But I wanted to move to uh, gene editing. Um, you worked at the uh, in the Institute of the Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Dotna and her and her colleague uh, Emmanuel Charpentier. Uh, it's just Jennifer's institute. Just Jennifer's, okay, at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Because you are the uh, recipient of a very prestigious Fulbright Masaryk um, scholarship, yes. fellowship, right? So, uh, can you tell us what, what you did at the, at the institute, uh, whether you worked directly with Jennifer, and then we will move a, a bit on, uh, I would like to explore more about what her contribution was, what did she get the Nobel Prize for? Uh, so I didn't work uh, mm -hmm. like under Jennifer. I did have um, several meetings with her, mm -hmm. and I met her several times. I talked with her several times, but I didn't work under her. But the institute is absolutely amazing because she was able to put together several teams, several laboratories of amazing people who are all striving to make gene therapy accessible, which is something I really love and it's very unique. So her vision is to make gene therapy accessible to everyone, not to be a thing for the for rich. You know, so it's accessible in poorer countries to um, underrepresented communities and historically, uh, oppressed communities as well. So I really like this noble cause, which is, I think, very rare to see. And those scientists that work there are like the best in the field, in the world. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge privilege for me to be able to work there. Yeah, it's a hu huge prestige. And can you tell us a, a little bit more about what she got the award for, the mm -hmm. Nobel Prize? So Jennifer Doudna got the Nobel Prize in 2020 together with Emmanuel Charpentier. Mm -hmm. And they got the Nobel Prize for discovery of CRISPR. And for discovery of CRISPR as a gene editing tool. And that's very important to say, because CRISPR was first discovered as bacterial immunity. And I can elaborate a little bit more on that. And actually, the first paper that kick-started this whole thing and then the Nobel Prize was a paper in 2012 in science and this paper talked about CRISPR as a bacterial immunity and outlined the idea that it could be used for gene editing. And the first author on this paper is Martin Jinek, who is from Trinets, from Czech Republic, which is absolutely amazing that in the, in the beginning of this huge discovery stand this Czech guy, um, who is a brilliant scientist. And of course, um, the main authors also uh, were Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. Really nice. I'm going to sidetrack just a little bit um, because you may have uh, kids at home who are thinking about studying and you know um, uh, improving their, um, their their education. When we spoke, uh, I mentioned the Fulbright Masaryk Stipendium, uh, the fellowship, which is a very prestigious one. Uh, I still think very highly of people who who get that uh, stipendium. When we talked, uh, uh, Alžbeta, you mentioned that. Actually, you didn't find it that difficult to receive it. Can, can you tell us more about it? Because... Uh, I didn't know you were going to talk about maybe that. <laughs> Surprise. Maybe, maybe uh, it, will, uh, it will support you know, people in, in applying for that. Some people maybe think, oh, I'm just an ordinary Czech. You know, I'm not going to apply. I'm never going to get it. Tell us yeah, more. Yeah, it's a great thing to talk about, actually. Um, I think, yeah, I said that it wasn't that hard. And um, the truth is that... If you do extra stuff and you are interested throughout your life, mm -hmm. it's not that hard to get such prestigious uh, scholarship mm -hmm. eventually. Because mm -hmm. you already did the hard work beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I took it as a, you know, like, like a gift or something like that, you know, for the hard work that I did before, previously. Mm -hmm. So, and also I, I realized that many Czech people tend to um, think really um, lowly of themselves. I don't know if that's a word. Like, small of themselves. Underestimate yeah, themselves. Yeah, underestimate themselves. 
and there is no reason for that. Like, we are smart, and we have great minds in our country, and many people are so scared of disappointment, of, of uh, being rejected, that they don't even try. And I actually thought it's gonna be much harder to get the scholarship. I didn't think I'm gonna get it. Mm -hmm. And eventually it, it was fine. It was okay. <laughs> like, you know, if you have a good project and you yeah. have a good aim and you, you, you say like, why is it so important for you to do this research in the US? Like why you can't mm -hmm. do it in Czech Republic? And y you know, if all this fits into their picture, you're good to go. Like, th yeah. that's it. And how did it change your, let's say, career or your f your future studies? How did it influence you? Oh, it was a major, major career a milestone. point. Yeah. 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 In what way? Well, just the experience working under such amazing mm -hmm. researchers and working, um, yeah, with people who are just like the best in the field. This mm -hmm. is what I wanted from that. I wanted to work with the people who are the best in the field, mm -hmm. so I could learn from the best. And this is exactly what it delivered. Yeah, and very nice. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, Alžbeta, could you explain the concept of CRISPR and its functionality uh, in altering the genetic sequ sequence? Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting because I don't know if you knew, but bacteria, certain types of bacteria have immune system. And we never learned that at school because we didn't know about it back then. But um, bacteria can get infected by viruses. And scientists find out that certain types of bacteria are immune to viruses. And they were wondering why. And they found out that those types of bacteria have a library in their genome. And in that library, they save bits and pieces of DNA of viruses that attacked them before, so they can remember them. So once a virus attacks this bacteria, this bacteria goes to its library, scans it, and asks, like, have I, have I encountered this virus before? And if it has its sequence in the library, it's capable to go back to the virus and cut its genome and basically gets, ri gets rid of it. So this is really interesting. This is how CRISPR was discovered. And then it was proposed that we might be able to engineer this whole system in a way that it can be used to cut human genes, to cut human genome precisely. <coughs> and I wanted to... Um, explain it on a video that I like to use. So, in every cell of your body, uh, you have you have nucleus. There are some cells that don't have nucleus, but let's say in every cell. And in the nuclei, it's fine if you don't have it. It's okay. <laughs> It's okay, you can do it without it, yeah. So, and in the nucleus of your cells, uh, there are chromosomes, and those chromosomes are made of DNA, and each cell of your body has the same set of chromosomes, has the same DNA, and this DNA is called genome, it's a set of all those genes that are in your body. And what CRISPR can do is that we can design so-called guide. It's a really tiny piece of RNA, which is specific specific sequence in your genome. Uh, we know how our genome looks because it was sequenced. And so you can tailor this whole system in a way that it scans the genome and searches for the sequence in the genome that is compatible to this guide. And this guide is bound to Cas enzyme. And this enzyme acts as molecular scissors, basically, and cuts the DNA precisely. So you can basically like engineered this whole machinery in a way that you know where it cuts precisely. And even when I say precisely, we know the nucleotide where it cuts. So nucleotide is all those A, T, C, G that you have in your genomes, those letters. So we know exactly in the whole genome where the system is gonna cut. And this can be used in various ways. Like you can, for example, uh, make the genome lose its function like when you have a, g a gene, you lose its function, sorry. So when you have a gene that is like m making some, some bad stuff, like causing a disease, or there is a mutation that is causing a disease, you can turn the whole thing off. Or you can, or like you- what, uh, what, for example, could you, could you give us an example? 
oh, well, for example, you have certain types of cancer mm -hmm. that um, where certain types of genes are turned on mm -hmm. and they are producing huge amounts of protein that is not yeah. um, physiological. So that's causing the cancer. Yeah. So you can turn this off. Or, for example, you can replace a whole gene. If you have a gene that is not functioning with CRISPR, you can replace it with a functional mm -hmm. one. Or you can insert a new sequence inside. Mm -hmm. And you can also regulate genes with it and so on. So there is a lot of stuff that you can do with CRISPR. And this is what is so unique about it. Because we had gene therapy before, but it was all very random. We basically took virus, we gutted the virus, used just the envelope, and then just inserted the gene inside and let the virus infect the cells. And you had no idea where it's going to insert, the, uh, insert, insert the, the, the DNA. And what happened back then, uh, back in the days in 90s, was that once this went to clinic, to clinical trials, those patients started having leukemia mm -hmm. because those genes that were just like put into a virus and they let them infect the cells, they were just inserting the genes absolutely randomly in the genome. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they just inserted them in the wrong place and cancer happened. So right now we have absolute control of whether, where we are inserting stuff or what we do with it. But um, let me just understand, you insert the stuff <laughs> uh, in labs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There has been a country which has greenlit this therapy to be used in clinical trial. Is, is that how we would use it in a... In a uh, it has been already in clinical trial. This is approval okay. for okay. use in clinic. All oh, right. Mm -hmm. So which country was it? It was the UK. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a week ago or something like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It's really recent news. Mm -hmm. And it's really amazing because it's just 11 years since the paper from Martinique. Mm -hmm that started this whole thing. So what does it mean in practice? Uh, I will go it's really fast. The NHS is going to cover it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I don't about know. that. But if I go to a doctor in, in London, they yes. will, they will uh, inject it in me yes. just right there on a the spot. No, not like that. Okay. This is what we are actually trying to do. So it's possible to inject it. But right now it's called ex vivo. So you need to take the cells outside of the patient. So they take um, stem cells. They take them out of the patient, they correct the stem cells, and then they put them back. So it's still tedious, it's still a burden on the patient, but it's curative, which means you change the person's life forever. Mm -hmm. We never had curative treatment for sickle cell disease, and it's a horrible disease. So those people with sickle cell, Mm. And that's usually in uh, developing countries, is it right? It's not about developing no. countries. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a thing of uh, black people. Uh -huh. okay. So it doesn't matter where they mm -hmm. are. Um, so it's tied to, to, to them. Okay. And the reason why uh, we see sickle cell in black population is because um, it's, a, it's evolutionary adaptation mm -hmm. to malaria. Mm -hmm. So people who carry the sickle cell trait can't get malaria. Mm -hmm. But once you inherit those both mutations, mutations from both of your parents, you get sickle cell disease, mm -hmm. which is horrible. And, and like people die at 48 years old in horrible pains. So it's a debilitating disease. And, and the fact that right now we already have CRISPR in clinic in the UK mm -hmm. is, is a huge hope for, for millions of people. That's great. I wanted to also ask you, uh, you you've mentioned something. Um, how does the process differ when you, uh, when you apply the CRISPR uh, to an individual like myself, for example, and to embryo? Yeah, there is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Because once you edit um, an adult, the, when the adult dies, their offsprings mm -hmm. are not going to carry the, the, the edit, the, you know, mm -hmm. the thing that you changed. But once you CRISPR an embryo, you're basically creating a new line of humans. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you edit an embryo, you edit every cell in the body, basically, of the future human, mm -hmm. which means also the sperm or mm -hmm. the egg. So once this human has children, there is a huge probability that this edit is going to be inherited. So you're basically yeah, creating a new line of humans, of edited people. Do you guys have any questions which, uh, after what you have just heard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, actually, I think it's a good time to take questions. I still have a few, but I would like to pause here a bit uh, and give you a chance to maybe clarify something. You know, I studied literature, so <laughs> some of my questions might not be exactly what you would ask. But please, let's do it. David, will you help us with that? Sure thing. Thank you so much. Anyone a question? The gentleman who's a pro in CRISPR. He Did probably have doesn't questions? have questions because he is a pro. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, you passion for what you're doing, and that you're actually decided to come here and also talk about that. And I think it's just a wonderful thing. So yeah, thank you. We can I talk later. Science. Mm -hmm. I used to do science in, 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 in plant research, where we used, oh, uh, well, colleagues of mine are still do the editing and stuff like that. I've never really been very around. So I've left the science at the time when the CRISPR was being discovered by Jane. Um, but it's still amazing uh, um, a piece of work, and I'm just following on the development of the te uh, technology that, as you just said, the speed with which it was it's sort amazing. of deployed is amazing. The fact that the Nobel Prize was awarded within just a couple of years, it's an, a huge recognition. And I think the promise that this technology can bring is, is, is also um, yes. marvelous. Yet. I mean, there are also yeah. some sort of a... We are going to talk the about, them. Of that, mm -hmm. yeah. about the dark Excellent. side. Thank you for the addition. Anyone else? Oh. And, the, and then the lady I here. I have a technical question. So you talked about how the CRISPR technology enables to cut the sequence at a particular place, but I didn't get to understand how do, do you recombine, or how, how do you make the ADN recombine? How do you get rid of that sequence? How do you evacuate it? What's, oh. what's happening after cutting, basically? Oh, uh, the cell takes care of it. So basically, it's not allowed in a cell uh, for any floating DNA uh, to survive for a long time. So once you cut it out, the, the cell takes care of it and destroys it. For the flo you, you mean the floating piece, right? Yeah. The cell machinery takes care of it. It's not, it's not going to be there anymore. It's not like there's a waste of uh, DNA floating in us. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And I think there was one more in front. Yeah, yeah the lady here. Uh, so thank you for the presentation of your work. It's uh, really fascinating. I would like to ask how are these uh, tests provided? You mentioned the clinical tests are starting or started just a few weeks ago. So could you please a bit explain how it's how it's provided? Because for someone who is not who has not scientific education at high level, it's maybe quite complicated to imagine what how how it all works and how you want to put it in practice. Oh, how the therapy itself, how it works. Yeah, mean? how the how the tests uh, the, the tests work. Oh, right now it's um, it's not in the clinical trial phase. Right now it's uh, in clinic, which means that it's going to be used on patients routinely. But you're asking about tr clinical trials, how they work? Yes. So clinical trials have several phases, and usually clinical trials take take years. So you need to test stuff on healthy patients. If you have a drug, you need to test stuff on healthy patients. You need to test doses. And then you, then you test it on actual patients. And in terms of CRISPR, uh, you can't test it on healthy people, honestly, because like, you know. And so how it was done is that they took patients with sickle cell disease and they just got um, their signed approval from them and they tested how this therapy worked works on, on patients already. But before that, it was done on animals. So you already know it has to work on animals and the animals have to be well in order to move further. But what is really important here is that sickle cell is a fatal disease. There is no cure for it. So moving forward with such clinical trial is easier than moving forward uh, with a clinical trial for some drug for a disease that already has a drug, for example. So when you're, start, when you're trying to cure incurable disease, it's easier to get approval from FDA or from any other agency and go further with it. I don't know if it answered your yeah, question. Thank you. Okay.
I think there's a lady, lady there behind, uh, behind the gentleman in the white shirt. Y you wanted to ask a question before, no? No? Maybe it, maybe it was answered. Okay. <laughs> I will make you ask questions. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your super exciting research. I am curious about nanorobots because I can imagine for like passive drug delivery systems, I can imagine how they find their way through the body. Mm -hmm. It's like a functionalized, uh, like click chemistry, like yes, exactly. maybe like a binding sites, external fields. But if you can, you give me an example, like a basic nanorobot that goes beyond passive drug delivery. Like how does it work? Yeah, I, I can imagine like it maybe burns glucose to go somewhere. Okay, how do you program it to go somewhere? How, yeah, it is a really good question, and I see you are a scientist. <laughs> yeah, um, honestly, right now, many runner robots are moving chaotically. So you're basically hiring the chance that they're going to meet the correct cell. So uh, our hearts are very powerful. They pump liters of blood in minutes, so the flow is really huge. And passive nanoparticles are just like flowing there. And once you have a nanorobot that's moving at least chaotically, it's capable of like, you know, encountering the correct cell quicker and the chances are higher. But then you have nanorobots who have directional movement, like you can use rotating magnetic field for that, for example, and then you can direct them towards the target. So, and also you have nanorobots that are capable of chemotaxis. So for example, when you have a tumor, the tumor secretes inflammatory cytokines or something like that. And those nanorobots are capable to sense it and go, they go against the concentration gradient of those cytokines into the site of the inflammation, which can be a tumor or, or anything else that secretes stuff like that. Okay, so they, they follow like a chemical gradient. That's, yes. That's already a nanorobot and not a passive system. Yes. Okay. And oftentimes, um, they also combine several fuels together. Like, for example, you have chemotaxis and a rotating mm -hmm. magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what I really like about nanorobots, once you compare it with passive nanoparticles, the difference is really huge. Mm -hmm. even, even if there is only chemotaxis, it's already boosting the efficiency of the delivery really well. Makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think a gentleman here wanted to ask a question as well. Uh, Over here. So a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that it's uh, already in clinic in the UK. And what is the timeline within the EU and the member states? Is there like a universal approval process for the all of EU or is it member state uh, sort of separate approval? Well, UK is outside of EU now. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know what their policies are. And honestly, I don't even know what the U EU policies are. It's really um, outside of the scope of my knowledge to be honest, but the whole approval was really fast. I remember when those clinical trials started, it was 2021, 2022. It was, it's like a few years ago. It's not really that long ago. And I might be kidding, it might be 2021, but like not earlier than that, as far as I know. So the approval came real fast. Uh, coming back to the nanorobots, I understand that CRISPR is so sexy that uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, lot of research groups across the world use it for different, let's say, for let's say plant uh, discovery, as we heard before, mm -hmm. and other uh, other areas. What about nanorobots? Is it also such a let's say topic which is booming these days? Because uh, let's say in Czech Republic, I know about two research groups engaged. So is it really that massive or is it something much smaller? Um, I don't think it's as massive as CRISPR. And honestly, I don't think there is anything as massive as CRISPR. Like the scope of how fast it all went from the discovery to clinic is extraordinary. I don't know if we have ever seen anything like it. And uh, nanorobots are a really new addition to the nano family, but it is really booming right now. And especially now, the researchers are communicating with each other a little bit better. Before, we had an issue that material scientists sometimes develop a nanorobot that could never be used in, in biological systems. So you had nanorobot fueled by something which was toxic. 
but still it was a discovery that was important in the beginning. But right now we know that we need to push those biocompatible fuels and biocompatible materials. So uh, these endeavors really create space for new discoveries. And I'm actually writing a review right now on nanorobotics, and there is so many amazing papers that are that happened in the last two years. And I think it's going to really um, change the future, honestly, because once this works, we could do amazing stuff. And also in countries that don't have access to sterile, mm, whatever, sterile stuff, like they can't do surgeries or so on. Nanorobots could really change um, things like that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have a question about controversies now. Give us some juice. <laughs> Can we talk about some uh, <laughs> some, some con controversial application of CRISPRs, for example? And I'm, I'm specifically uh, uh, interested in the dog. Did in a dog, yeah. In, in a dog, because I looked at a picture. Yeah. Uh, Algebra will uh, answer, and I felt sorry for it. But can you tell us what, what is it about? Yeah, so uh, CRISPR brought a lot of hope to people who are suffering with diseases. And with this came many, many controversial applications. And there is not that many, but I think even those few are too much right now. So there is a story about a super muscular dog. I really like to talk about it because it's kind of hilarious and, and cringe. It's not, it's not a story, it's true, right? Yeah, it yeah. is true. Yeah, it's not like a fairy tale, okay. but yeah. Um, so Chinese scientists came up with this idea to create the super muscular dog. So in your body, you have a gene that is called myostatin. And this gene produces a protein that basically acts like a stop to your muscles so you don't grow to enormous sizes. So everyone has myostatin. And they basically block the myostatin, the function of myostatin, which means that the dogs that were born had like a huge muscle mass. They looked like a dog Rambo. And back then, um, it was said that they might use them for like military purposes. I actually Googled like a few months ago and I couldn't find like any more information on that. So I don't know if they're using that. But what is really interesting here and what is really important to, to, to note is that this change was done in embryos. So they basically took dog embryos deleted the myostatin and created a new dog line of supermuscular dogs. And so the question is, if they can do it in dogs, can they do it in humans? Can we create supermuscular soldiers, for example, like a new line of people that would have super muscles? And editing in embryos is very, very controversial. Back in the day, I can say it, if it is, if, as if it was like a long time ago, it's not that long time ago, it's 2017, I think, or 18, what we're talking about. But there were no laws that would um, forbid to uh, do stuff like that. And uh, it continued. So first was the, the dog, and then uh, Chinese scientists decided to edit human embryos um, to correct a rare heart disease. But they didn't implant those embryos into a womb. So no humans were born out of that. But it was a step further. It was already in the gray area. There was this question, like, should we edit embryos? Like, should we even play with this? And there, were an there was another team doing similar thing. And then in 2018, there was this breaking point where there was a conference in Shenzhen, I think, and this Chinese scientist called He Jiankui uh, came up with um, his research that he actually CRISPRed embryos and let them born. And we have three CRISPR babies right now. There are twins, Lulu and Nana, and then there is a third child. I don't know the name of, of the child, but those children basically cannot contract HIV. So He Jiankou decided to, no one gets why, honestly, but He Jiankou decided that he will CRISPR those embryos so when they are babies, they cannot get, and adults, they cannot contract HIV. That's the only advantage there. And it was a huge controversy. Like, the scientific community was outraged. People were really scared because the boundary was crossed. And it was crossed really soon. The paper that we talked about is 2012, Nobel Prize 2020. This is 2018 when he let those two, three children to be born. 
So it's really early after the discovery. And what is also controversial about that is not only he created a new line of humans that cannot contract HIV, but also it was discovered that they might have their brains altered. Um, because there are few people, well, sorry, um, there, are, there were mouse experiments with a similar thing. These mouse had the same mutation um, that prevented them from getting HIV, and scientists found out that those mice were very intelligent. That they were navigating mazes much better, they, were, they had much better memory than regular mice. So it's thought that maybe those children would have this enhancement of better intelligence. But it's not just this intelligence, there is more. So uh, it was discovered that there is also a downside to this. Uh, there are several people in the world that have this mutation, that, mm, mm, they, they are born like that, that they cannot contract HIV, and they have a huge disadvantages, like they can die much younger when they have multiple sclerosis, or they can die uh, from vac vaccinations, or like few flu and stuff like that. So, yeah, and the thing is that those those papers were really old. So they were out there even before Hedjanku started this. So it's really hard to believe that he didn't know about them. But he might have decided to ignore them or it was worth it, even though he you know, could, could bring this um, disadvantage onto those girls. And what is another controversy is that we don't even know if this, those parents knew about it. If he if he even told them, and there is another. Isn't he in jail now for that? Uh, he is out of jail He's already. Of jail. Yeah, <laughs> but there is another thing. Uh, actually, those parents were brought into this idea of of, of Hejianku, uh in a way that I think is not really ethical. Uh, they told them the researchers told them that they could have in vitro fertilization for free if they let them CRISPR their babies. Because I think the father had HIV. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's really, um, it's a huge, um, you're taking a chance if you're having uh, a child, the natural way, if you are HIV positive. So it's better to have in vitro fertilization, which is, which is really expensive. So they told them, oh, you can have IVF for free, but we will CRISPR your babies. Mm -hmm. And so this is also unethical by itself, yeah. And Hejianku was sent to jail for three years and he's out of jail right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, designer babies and muscular dogs, um, this is already a fine line. Um, and I think the concept of, you know, you, you mentioned uh, military personnel with big, big muscles. I come from a military family. I know muscles are, aren't what you need if you want to be a good soldier, but um, the concept of master race uh, you know, um, happened globally throughout the history, the past. And I know you, you told me that someone, uh, well, you told me that Adolf Hitler got somehow inspired by this, by this therapy or, or a theory of gene editing. Can you, can you tell us something? Uh, no, 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 not gene editing. Uh, no. He got inspired by eugenics, okay. which oh. was born in the US. Yes. Yes. Many people don't know it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the Nazis who invented eugenics. It mm -hmm. was Americans. Okay. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I, w I, I thought it was Germans. Yeah, it was Americans in, in the early 20th century. Uh, they came with this idea that everything is inherited. Like mm -hmm. your intelligence, yeah. your character. Even if you are poor, it's inherited. So actually the, the founder of uh, eugenics is Sir, Fra Sir, Sir Francis Galton, mm -hmm. who is a cousin, the cousin of, um, of Darwin. And he came up with eugenics in 18, 1880 first. He coiled this term. And he said that, well, it would be amazing if we could breed out certain characteristics from our um, genetic pool. And he thought that we could breed um, character mm -hmm. the way we breed um, color in guinea pigs, for example. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was going after people who were like had epilepsy or were promiscuous. He thought all these things are genetic, mm -hmm. even like size of a family, genetic, everything. 
So it was really ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But then in the early 20th century in the US, they put it into action, and which is really, really scary. And at first, mm, it was stuff like um, eugenic certificates, for example. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you are considered eugenically clean, you got this certificate, this card, which says that you are capable of Eugenic love, you have keep, you have eugenic love possibilities, or something like that, like some 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 phrase like this. So, you, like when you went on a date, you could show this certificate to your future spouse, like I'm eugenically clean, or like or like for example, there were these um, fairs for like where you could um, show off your stock, like your beautiful cows and your 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 hens with beautiful feathers. And back in the early 20th century, what they did was that. They even had like a eugenic house where they showed like the best eugenic families. So it was an exhibition of like cows and stuff and also eugenic families. And families were competing with each other, which one is more eugenically clean. And those, those traits that were considered were stuff like jealousness or the size of a family or how nice you are if you're th Thai in church and stuff like that. So it was really ridiculous. And also it was really racist because all these competitions were, of course, f only for white people, because if you were black, you were considered lesser than, and it was like, eugen you were not eugenically clean, because you were black. So that by itself is very controversial, yeah. and that's how eugenics started. And then uh, it went step further with uh, forced sterilizations, which we are still talking about the US, not about yeah. uh, Germany. So forced sterilizations, California actually, where I spent my last year was the best in sterilizations. They were able to sterilize more people in one year than the whole US. And the problem with that, only well, it's a forced sterilization, right? It's a problem by itself, but the bigger problem is that they were sterilizing people like women that were promiscuous or people with epilepsy, people who were alcoholics, people who were angry or I don't know, like stuff like that. And the problem is that if you had someone, some relative you didn't like, you could say that he was feeble-minded. And the term feeble-minded, you could hide anything under that. So if, if the person didn't agree with the government, he was considered feeble-minded and could be sterilized. And there were even institutions which went even further because it was desirable to get rid of these people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were like institutions where you can send people for sterilization, where you can send people to get rid of them. And some of those hospitals or institutions did stuff like they, they gave them milk with tuberculosis. And they thought, oh, if they drink this milk and they don't die of tuberculosis, we, this means that they are eugenically clean. Of course they died. Mm -hmm even more reinforced their idea that they were not eugenically clean in the first place. Yeah. And then Germany took an example of it. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a good idea for the next uh, Net Netflix series, <laughs> which you have just said, but it's, it's something that really happened. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Ashwita, we are nearing the end. Uh, fast forward from the past to present. What is next for research in this field? And what's next for you as well? Oh, for research, I think the approval of the sickle cell um, therapy is a huge motivation mm -hmm. for the research, and more diseases will follow in the footsteps of sickle cell. So it seems that HIV will be the next, might be the next, mm -hmm. so we will be able to finally cure HIV for good in this way. Mm, there is amazing research on Huntington's disease. There is amazing research on hereditary deafness. Mm -hmm. So all these diseases could be next to be approved to be cured by CRISPR, which is absolutely amazing. So, yeah. Thank you. So next, what's next for you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Finish my PhD. Yeah, yeah. How is that looking? Oh, I should be finished soon. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, congratulations. Um, I have a joke for you <laughs> on this theme. Um, before I came uh, down here, I asked ChatGPT to give me a, uh, a joke on gene editing because today is 30 years of uh, introduction of uh, ChatGPT in Europe uh, and 30 years in, in the Czech Repu um, uh, a year in the Czech Republic. What is gene editor's favorite piece of clothing? 
designer jeans. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Alspita, thank you. All right, let's take some additional questions. If you, if you have any after what uh, has just been said, uh, anyone would like to ask anything? No, let's save it for networking, shall we? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would like to thank to all of you for coming tonight and for being solidar and wearing a face mask tonight. Thank and you of course, <laughs> it was because of me, and I'm really grateful <laughs> for that. Thank you. Indeed, thanks a lot for that. And I cannot forget to uh, to thank uh, both of you uh, on the stage uh, for for navigating us for at least for uh, so many of us still a very difficult topic. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, now I would like to invite you uh, downstairs. There is a really nice exhibition of uh, uh, Jiří Petrbok. And also, as usual, I would like to invite to the glass of South Moravian wine. And uh, thank you very much also to all uh, of us, uh, to um, uh, every uh, team of uh, Science Cafe. And uh, thank you very much. And see you soon. <laughs>